Hello, everybody. Hello. So lovely to see you all today. There's a lot of us in the room this morning, over a thousand of us. So welcome and welcome to a Cardo session for National Graduate Week 2021. And National Graduate Week is brought to you by Career Map. Um, I am Heather. I'm an account director at Career Map and I am head of National Graduate Week. Um, this session today is going to be run by Henry, as you can see here on the first slide, he is the Emerging Talent Specialist. We also have graduates from Ricardo who are Joe and Aoife. So they will be talking about how to assess a virtual assessment centre, as you can see here. Um, feel free to ask any questions that you've got in the chat box. And what we'll be doing is collating them and asking the team um, as many questions as we can um, after, their, um, after their presentation. Don't worry if you don't get to see the whole presentation. We are recording it and it will be on the National Graduate Week website on demand probably after next week. There's a lot to get through. Um, and there's also information on the National Graduate Week website as well. So we've got the Ocado Group profile that is, is live. So um, I think without any further ado, I'd like to pass on to the team. Um, I'm going to switch my camera and microphone off now. So I'm just going to disappear and I'll be back for the Q&A. So over to you guys. Amazing. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining uh, us this morning. Uh, so yeah, over the next kind of half an hour, maybe 40 minutes or so, um, I will talk you through everything Virtual Assessment Centre. And I'll, I'll kind of give you a quick overview um, in a moment about exactly all the different things that I will aim to cover. Um, I guess first off, just to quickly introduce myself. So uh, my name's Henry. Um, as Heather said, I'm the Emerging Talent Specialist. Essentially what that means is I am the recruiter for our early careers programs. So I've been in this role for maybe a little over two years. Um, I've gone through, this is my third cycle of recruiting graduates at Ocado. Uh, so when I first joined, we were recruiting about 70 grads across our kind of 10, uh, 11 different programs. Uh, this year we're recruiting 115 grads, uh, probably a little bit more than that when it comes down to it um, across our nine different programs. So I've done real life assessment centers in person in the office, I've done a virtual assessment center that we organized, you know, a week after, uh, you know, a week in advance right through to now where we've run probably over 30 or 40 virtual assessment centers. And we've kind of honed it and tweaked it as we've gone through. And so I can share kind of um, some bits and bobs about how that all went. Um, also on the call, um, again, as, as kind of Heather said, we've got Joe and Aoife. So Joe is one of our business management graduates. Um, and Aoife is one of our people graduates, so that's one of our HR graduates. So they will be around at the end. Uh, as, as I'm going, if you guys have any questions, uh, we'll kind of be collating them as we go. And then uh, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions myself, or if you've got anything that might be a little bit more specific to being a graduate at Ocado, or what it was like for the graduates going through that recruitment process themselves, um, they'll be here to, to share all of their insights and everything as well. Fantastic. So um, before I jump into everything um, virtual assessment center um, related, uh, just to give you a very quick overview of who Ocado are and what we do. So um, yeah, our overall mission is changing the way the world shops for good. Um, everyone, I'm as well, I'm assuming most people here are probably familiar with Ocado retail. Uh, so you may have seen the vans going around. Uh, you may be familiar with, you know, the website that people can log on to to, to do their online deliveries uh, and their online shopping. Uh, we actually are slightly separate to Ocado Retail. And so um, what I'll be able to do is uh, I won't talk through all of the bullet points on this because I could probably talk for about five hours about the history of Ocado and the ins and outs of exactly what we do. Um, but essentially, when we started in, in the year 2000, we were what you probably know Ocado as today, which is the kind of Ocado.com website that have all the delivery vans. But as we were trying to solve the problem of how do we do online delivery in a cost effective, um, efficient way that's actually going to be uh, profitable, because at the moment it's, it's, you know, doing it manually isn't particularly profitable, uh, it involves lots of people and people running around warehouses and all, all, all that kind of stuff. What we had developed in that in the course of that kind of 20 years are you know almost fully automated warehouses that are delivering people shopping for them so if you're 
wandering around a, a warehouse doing someone's online delivery as a human, it probably takes you about 20 minutes, maybe 25 minutes to do a 50 item shop. With all of the robots and the bots and the automation that we've created, a 50 item shop takes about a minute and a half, I think it is. It's it's pretty crazy. So we've got maybe you know five or six of these warehouses now that are kind of live across the UK. Um, and it was in 2013 that there was the the kind of big shift of what Ocado retail turning into what Ocado Group is today, which is when we first asked, uh, we signed our first client, which is Morrison's. So if you go onto a Morrison's website, if you are getting an online delivery from Morrison's, it's actually going off to an Ocado warehouse. The robots are actually, you know, picking and, and packing all of the Morrison's food. It actually then goes into an Ocado van, but it just looks like a Morrison's van. And then we we kind of deliver it on, on, on Morrison's behalf, essentially. And so that was a bit of a trial run to go, okay, uh, you know, if we're going to really scale this business globally, rather than going into international markets, rather than going to America or, um, or Canada or France and saying, hey, guys, we're a new grocery retailer on the block. Why don't you come shop at us rather than the retailer that you're you've been loyal to for the, for your for your life? Uh, what we've done instead is partner up with the biggest grocers in those markets, and we're helping them provide online delivery um, at, in a way that is completely scalable and is a lot more profitable than you know what your kind of your legacy typical um, grocery retailers are, are kind of able to do because they haven't got the the huge you know infrastructure and software engineers and engineering functions that we have in order to kind of build and, and develop all of these things so you'll see we signed lots of these international deals and and now we're currently at this crazy hyper growth stage you know we've there was a live stream the other day and we're going to double the size of the company in the next three years so we spent 21 years getting to the size that we are now and then in the next three years we're going to double it so Things are things are very busy, shall we say, at Acardo. Things are growing very quickly, um, and the reason for that is, you know, we've built six warehouses in the UK at the moment, and I believe we've got deals to sign something in the region of 30, 40 more warehouses internationally. So, the rate that we're having to deliver all of these things is pretty crazy, um, and you'll see as well, um, yeah, and, and I can kind of talk through what that means in terms of our international expansion, um, but. Because we're in this position now where we are essentially a business to business solutions provider, um, which sounds a little bit buzzwordy, but essentially we're selling the technology to our international clients. Uh, we need to make sure that we're still staying on that cutting edge. You know, the journey's not done now. And so very recently in the, in the last kind of year or so, uh, we've been doing lots of investment in things like robotic arms that are going to be doing, you know, physical picking and packing. Um, right through to investments in businesses such as um, Exbotica and, and there's a few others that do self-driving vehicles. So the idea is actually, are we gonna have self-driving vehicles that are going around the warehouse moving stock around, or are we gonna have uh, self-driving vehicles potentially delivering people shopping for them in the future? So we've made this complete transition now into a, a kind of tech and engineering business um, and actually Akari.com has sort of separated out from us and we treat them as a client. So we've kept the same name just to keep things really confusing. But um, but yeah, that's essentially a little bit about what we do and a little bit of the history of, of who we are. Um, I'd recommend there's a lot of videos on YouTube. They're only a couple of minutes long. Um, but if you search onto YouTube to um, just type in a Cardo Group Warehouse, there's one by Tom Scott in particular that just shows you how all the bots work. And it's when you first see it, it looks like something a little bit out of Black Mirror. Um, but yeah. I'm going to try and stop talking about all of this now because I think I kind of geek out about it a little bit too much, but it's some seriously cool stuff. And uh, yeah, that's just a little bit about who we are. And this just gives you a little bit of a view in terms of where we've signed all of those international deals. So we now actually have a presence in over 10 different countries. And that means that we've got offices. That means that, you know, whether it's our graduates or people around the business, they're constantly speaking to these people internationally. And it means as well, there's quite a lot of international travel that happens. Um, and those opportunities are also available for grads sometimes, obviously when travel restrictions ease, uh, or now that they have been easing, it means that we're able to actually go over and visit these guys and see the warehouses and, and have some more face-to-face -face contact with our clients and, and graduates also, depending on the rotation, the program that you're on, uh, often do go along for those journeys as well. And this is then a little bit about all of our programs. So this is our cohort that have just joined. So if you look closely and squint, you might see Aoife and Joe somewhere in there. I think I can see Aoife in the green trousers on the left. Um, but yeah, we've got nine programs that we're recruiting for this year. As I mentioned, in total, that's over 115 um, across all of those programs. Um, 
And yeah, there's plenty more information about each of those programs on our website. But I will stop yabbering on about Ocado and I will get to the meat of it. So virtual assessments, are they just a fad? So I think no one, obviously no one anticipated having to move uh, assessment centers virtually. And really no one, you know, as of last year really had, um, you know, as part of their recruitment process, a virtual assessment center. It just wasn't, wasn't really the done thing. So pretty much overnight, everyone had to kind of muddle together what these virtual assessment, assessment centers might look like. And I think for a long time, people were thinking, is this going to just be a very temporary fix to the, to the situation that we are at the moment? And as soon as everything clears up, are we going to go straight back to, to in-person assessment centers? I think for, for a lot of businesses, sometimes that, that question is still, I guess, to be decided. But looking at the research, there's a, there's a company called um, the ISE, so the Institute of Student Employers. They do a lot of research with, with different employers um, that are recruiting for, for graduates. And um, the kind of the, the feel at the moment, at least anyway, is that there's this, I think virtual assessments are gonna be here to stay. Not to say, you know, 100%, you know, every, every business or the entire recruitment process is gonna be virtual. But I think the benefits that a virtual assessment center is able to offer um, means that actually I think the the kind of the, the structure of recruitment processes are going to change. So you guys might be familiar with uh, obviously the changes that have happened due to Brexit in terms of visas. It's actually made it for a lot of business businesses a lot easier to recruit for international talent. So when we ran our um, virtual assessment centre campaign last year, uh, we had people that were dialing in from Malaysia, from Greece, from France. Um, from a couple of other countries, we had lots of people dialing in from just places like Scotland or Newcastle. Um, and what that has meant for our cohort this year is that we've been able to uh, attract a much more wider and diverse pool of talent than we may have been able to do previously. Um, it's not to say it was impossible. Obviously, we would cover people's travel and things like that before. But it's still, it was a barrier for entry for a lot of graduates that might have to travel. And now that it's easier for us to be able to hire internationally, actually, this is enabling us to connect with a much wider range of talent across not just the UK, but also internationally. What, so I think a lot of businesses understand that now and are going to probably keep some sort of element of virtual assessment centers. One idea that we kind of uh, kind of debating at the moment is do we have a kind of a virtual assessment center that's maybe slightly bigger than what we normally would do and then actually trim that down to maybe you know, say we're looking for five graduates, maybe from that virtual assessment center, we invite seven or eight into the office and we run a, a kind of a couple of interviews and things like that. And then from those seven or eight, we then we then make offers from there. So you may actually see that the assessment center stage kind of gets divided up into two. There's a kind of first stage, which is then virtual, and then a second stage where people are invited into an office. But we will see. We will see. Um, I think a lot of businesses are going to probably do things slightly differently. But um but that's kind of where we're sitting at the moment. So what might a virtual assessment center look like? Um, so this is a very just general overview. Uh, obviously I can talk about how we do it and I'll kind of mention about some of the other things that I know other businesses do, but we will have, you know, we'll, we will host it all on Google Hangouts. So we just use um, basically, you know, similar to Teams and, and things like that, that you guys may be familiar with. We do a welcome call in the morning, do some icebreakers, try and get everyone to kind of get to know each other. Um, we then have two group activities. So you'll be split up into groups. The activities last for about 45 minutes long. Uh, you then kind of have a break in between those two group activities. Um, and then you'll do a, a kind of combined interview and presentation. So that's then you'll be just by yourself with two assessors. Um, you'll have a topic that you would have been told uh, a week or so before the assessment center to prepare for. You present for five to 10 minutes. Um, and then you have a bit of a Q&A afterwards. Um, and then we get everybody back together again and we do a bit of a kind of uh, any last questions and, and, and say goodbye to everybody. Um, you'll notice our assessment center is very much focused around group activities. Um, and there's a good reason for that. A lot of research that we've been kind of uh, looking at says, um, you know, group activities are really where you get a true reflection of how someone's going to be able to perform in a role. And also um, it tends to be the case, and obviously this is, speaking quite generally, um, people from a higher socioeconomic background overperform in interviews and uh, presentations, and people from a lower socioeconomic background tend to struggle in those areas. So we still have it as an element, but we wanted to move the main focus of our assessment centers away from that 
and really focus it on, on group activities. But that's just a cardio group. Other companies will do it differently and have more of a focus on interviews and, and things like that, potentially. Uh, also, they may have things like psychometric tests. They may have things like networking lunches that you kind of, you know, you have lunch and you can kind of chat to people as you go um, and all sorts of other, other kind of bits and bobs as well. So thinking specifically about group activities, the nature of a group activity very much changes when you're doing it on a virtual call. What used to happen when we were in the office is we would have a group activity, maybe there'd be six to eight people in a group. Um, and as the group activity would kind of play out, quite often people would break out into smaller sections. We'd go, right, let's all discuss it in smaller groups, come back together in 10 minutes and, uh, and then, you know, uh, you know, um, share everyone's ideas that we've been able to split. Um, but however, you know, and, and there might be lots of paper flying around. We might have a whiteboard where people are making notes on top of the whiteboard. Um, but obviously being virtually, uh, things kind of change a fair bit. So um, here, I guess, is, is kind of the main thing that I would, I would kind of think about ahead of any assessment center when you're going into a group task. Really try and understand exactly what they are looking for. And when you're then preparing and you're kind of scenario planning and imagining how the, the group activity will go, have a think about how you're going to demonstrate these activities in the assessment center. If you don't know exactly what they're looking for, ask the recruiter, ask the person that's scheduling your um, your virtual assessment center. You know, you're going to be speaking to people like me or people like uh, Aoife and Joe here who would invite you into an assessment center. We want you to do well at this assessment center. If the better you guys do, the better we look in terms of how we do our jobs. Obviously, there's an element of fairness that we can't tell everyone all the answers and exactly what's going to happen. But if you ask certain questions like, you know, what kind of grads tend to do well at assessment centers? What kind of behaviors are you guys looking at, at assessment centers? Um, normally, you know, people are more than happy to kind of share that general information and, and, and give a help. So again, it might be slightly, every business is going to be assessing slightly different. And a, a grad that's going to do particularly well at Ocado is going to be slightly different to a grad that does particularly well at Deloitte or any other kind of um, other business. And so Talking from an Ocado perspective, uh, we are definitely looking for collaborators, people that are curious, people that are very good at teamwork. Um, and so I guess building on that, it's really, we, when we're hiring 115 graduates, we, we can't hire 115 people that are all identical or are all going to be leaders or are all going to be whatever it may be. Um, so we are looking for a really diverse uh, group of uh, behaviors and, and and kinds of people and that's to say you know what we what we really try and think about ahead of group activities is what value are you contributing rather than just volume and so just because someone may have you know said right I'm going to be leader let me keep time and I'm going to tell everyone you know this is what we're going to do for the next 10 minutes that is great and you know sometimes those people are needed within group activities but that's not to say that that intrinsically is the good or bad thing to do it's about how you do that and the value that you're adding whilst you're doing that we've had group activities where people have been really quiet they've been very shy um, but actually when they have contributed it's been really really valuable it's been things that, that they've contributed because they've realized the group have missed out on a really key bit of detail and they've kept them to time and they've um, really with the little contribution that they had, they actually had a huge impact on the overall success of the team. And those are the people that we're really looking for. It's the it's it's adding that value and 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 and, and making that impact. So to mention to go back to what I was I was kind of talking before about um, how the nature of these group activities are quite different. I think when we were in person, it would actually be quite it'd be easier for those that have a slightly quieter voice and maybe struggle to, to stick up their hand and kind of make themselves heard um, to contribute because you could easily split off into smaller groups and then you might be speaking just on a one-to-one a -one with somebody in the group. That's not the case on a lot of these group assessments, uh, virtual assessments now. Because you're on a call with potentially six other people, it can feel harder to, to get a word in sometimes. And that is where we would always encourage people, if there's a hands up function, like a lot of these platforms uh, have, please use the hands up function. Um, you know, do make sure that you are able to, to contribute. And 
And on the flip side of that, if maybe you are someone that feels a little bit more confident and is able to contribute more, make sure that you are proactively involving other people in the group. That is not going to look bad on you. If you notice that someone's not been able to speak for the last 10, 15 minutes and you actually go to them, hey, what are your thoughts on this? Do you have a do you have an opinion? Are you, you know, I'd love to hear your your kind of take on on you know the direction that we're going on on this group activity. That is going to make you look really, really strong as in terms of being able to be a group team player. And if that person ends up coming up with a really, really great idea, you've contributed in being able to help that idea be heard and help that help that come out. So those are certain things to kind of think about. It can be a little bit harder for those more introverted candidates, but really, you know, make sure you use, you know, the tools that are there um, to make sure your voices are heard. Um, so I think I kind of jumped ahead of myself there, but yeah, some general top tips uh, before diving straight into the group activity, really, really make sure you understand exactly what's being asked of you. And also make sure that everybody in the in the team also understands what's being asked of them and that you're all on the same page and moving in the right direction. It can be quite easy to kind of not necessarily panic, but see a group activity and jump straight in. You know, although it might feel like you don't have a lot of time, what's really, really important is that when you jump into the activity, you're not wasting any time, potentially misunderstanding exactly what's being asked of you. Um, so that's really important. Um, yeah. As I mentioned, understanding exactly the behaviors that they're looking for and tailoring your own behaviors to make sure that you're kind of helping the assessors understand, uh, helping the assessors in in what they're scoring for. Uh, and they can see that from yourself, um, making sure everyone can be heard and just generally being yourself. And then here's a, a quote from Georgia Felton. She actually attended our very first ever virtual assessment center. Um, so yeah, that is, she's one of our finance grads. Um, so in terms of then interviews and presentations, um, this one, I guess, really the nature of an interview and presentation doesn't change greatly from, uh, from when you were in person. So again, really have a think about when you're going into, this, uh, into these assessments, what exactly it, and that might come, what exactly are they looking for and that might come out in the kinds of uh, topic that they're specifically asking you to present on but also just in the way that you are presenting yourself and, and being engaging um, and the way that you're you're interacting with the assessors when you come onto the call um, so in terms of what's really important when you're going into an interview and presentation um, when you're preparing the interview, please, please, please make sure you understand exactly what they want when you're going into that presentation. Sometimes if you just, you know, misread the brief or, you know, you misunderstood it, that can put a whole a spanner completely in that part of the assessment center and that can really affect your, uh, your performance. So it's always worth, again, that point of contact that you have who's helping arrange you, uh, get you into that assessment center speak to them if you maybe you know come up with a draft just sense check it with them and make sure that you're on the right path um also really make sure you understand how long you should be presenting for and make sure as well that you definitely do keep to that time if you're a little bit like me sometimes you ramble on a little bit and can overrun on presentation times um, and that's a worry going into the assessment ask the assessors at the beginning are you going to hard cut me off at you know, five, 10 minutes when whatever the allotted time is, or is there a kind of bit of leeway? And that also can help you with your, um, with how strict you need to be with the time. Because sometimes we we have some assessors that say it's, it's five minutes presenting, at the end of the five minutes, I'm gonna let you know and time's up. Whereas some people might be a little bit more lenient and will let you run to six minutes. And it's really important to know that going in. So you know if, you know, how much leeway you have. Uh, this goes for everything really, but um, as, as the group activity, but in particular, the, the interviews and presentations really do try and make sure you have, you know, good lighting, clear quality and good audio as well. Um, I would always, this is, if you're gonna take one thing away from this entire presentation, take this away, try and get some headphones to help with your audio. When when the, the, the audio that comes out of a, of a laptop tends to be quite tinny and, and isn't particularly, you know, um, you know, the depth of sound isn't particularly good, but also you can then sometimes get echo and, and kind of reverberate as the laptop is hearing itself from what's being played. So, um, and that can then often just cause a bit of a distraction and, and, and can be a bit challenging. So even if it's, you know, the, 
iPhone headphones or, or whatever it may be, I would always recommend having them because it will, um, yeah, it will help you engage in, and, and come across a lot better during the assessment centers. Um, and yeah, I think as well, what's a, a big benefit of being able to um, engage virtually is that you're able to have a lot more notes and, and pieces of paper in front of you that, that people can't necessarily see as you would do when you're in the office. So if you do understand exactly what, um, if you do understand exactly what the behaviors that they're assessing, or you do have maybe some phrases and things like that that you, you know you want to work in, you can have a list of bullet points in front of you. As long as you're not reading off it and making it too obvious, I think sometimes having a, a prompt to your right um, that you can kind of glance down at um, can definitely help sometimes with a little bit of nerves throughout the recruitment process. Um, and make sure you have your own questions as well ahead of the interviews and presentations and try and avoid the kind of generic ones that often do come up. It's not to say you can't ask, you know, what's your favorite thing about working here? Or, um, yeah, how would you describe the culture of the business? Because those are important questions. But I would also recommend trying to think about something maybe really specific or niche that you found out that you've read about the company. Um, if you know who's assessing you, maybe asking them something that you understand what they're, you know, is related to their job. Um, and make sure you ask that kind of specific question because they're going to remember that and that's going to help you stand out as, as a candidate. Uh, here's Himal. He's one of our engineering graduates. Um, and yeah, I think uh, his kind of general takeaways, do your research and, and just be confident in yourself about, um, about how you're, you're going to deliver it. So yeah, overall fundamentals, really make sure you've not got a window behind you. Um, you've got good lighting, you can be seen. Um, I would also recommend if you can, uh, know if you can log on on your phone or if you do have a, a spare laptop or iPad or something like that around the house, have that as a backup just in case. Um, and then everything else, you know, in terms of what I've mentioned there about just making sure you've done your own research. Um, you understand exactly what they're looking for um, and you've, you've practiced for the session. As well, this, I said before about um, if there's one thing that you take away, if there's two things to take away, this is the second thing that I would take away. An assessment center is as much about you understanding about a company, what they're like, what it's like to work for them, how they treat their candidates and how they treat their colleagues, as well as it is about them getting an assessment of you. You know, candidate, uh, you know, graduates are, it's a very, very competitive market from a company's perspective. And they should be absolutely showing off the very best of themselves when it comes to uh, giving you guys the best experience. So don't go into the assessment center just thinking this is all about them getting an assessment of me and I need to be on my best behavior. They should be showing off to you. And I think if you go into that mentality that you're actually almost assessing them as a company and you want to understand, you know, is this the kind of company that I want to work for? I think as well that can help as well settle some nerves because it's not a one-way street it's definitely um it's definitely it goes both ways and so yeah um yeah this is our kind of strap line as a team and this is sort of what we try to share with all of our candidates that are coming through the recruitment process and and how we um i guess sort of frame everything that we do as an emerging talent team at Acardo. You know, be bold, be inquisitive, share your ideas, uh, be unique, uh, understand what makes you stand out and, and, and absolutely be yourself. Um, be brilliant. Similarly, you know, understand what you bring to the role and, 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 and how you might be a good candidate for the position um, and be yourself. You know, there's no point in uh, pretending to be someone that you're not during a recruitment process and finding that actually once you start, um, you know, the company and the culture isn't the right fit for you. Um, if you're not the right fit for a company, that's not, you know, it's not the end of the world. It's probably not meant to be. And there will be a company out there that will be a good match for, for you and for who you are. Fantastic. So um, that's all from me. Um, I've tried to keep it to, to just about half an hour. So um, I can open up to a, a bit of a Q&A. Um, as a reminder, obviously, I'm here to answer any questions um, and can talk anything about assessments or uh, or grading and, and things like that. Um, but also Joe and Ifra are here who are graduates themselves.
been through the process themselves as well as now graduates at Cardo and have been working here for, for a little over two months now who um, can share their experiences about what life is like uh, a graduate is like and um, and what it's like working virtually and, and coming into the office and, and all that kind of good stuff as well right then well thank you very much um that was brilliant i have got some um well, quite a few questions for you actually i've been scribbling away so apologies if you have um answered a few of these then you've been talking and i've missed it but um i'm going to channel through everything so first of all um if you fail at the assessment center first time um can you try again so what is the process can you um, can I do it immediately or um, is there, is there a, a time frame? How does it work? Absolutely. Um, so going into an assessment centre, and again, I'm, I'll talk specifically about Accardo, but I'd imagine and hope that a lot of other businesses probably operate in a, on a similar process. So there's a few different outcomes that you can have from an assessment centre. So um, obviously there's you can get offered directly for the programme that you've applied for. What we increasingly have though, is when we see candidates, sometimes we think maybe you're not quite right for this program that you've specifically applied for, but but actually, you know, you've applied for the analyst program, but we think you'd be an amazing business management graduate, for example. And we have enough people that, you know, sit across all those different areas of the business at an assessment center. So even if you're not successful for that graduate program, we can move you over to another program and, and uh, you know, we, we're keen to always hold on to, to good people that we think would be a good fit. So there's that as an option as well. What we sometimes do as well is if someone, we see someone who might not be right for the graduate program, but we think actually you'll, you'd be good for a direct entry role because we've got so many roles that we're kind of advertising at the moment at Cardo, we can then often fast track them through a different recruitment process for a different role within a kind of given business area. So we can say, look, here's all the great feedback. They weren't right for the graduate program because they may be a little bit too experienced or actually we didn't think that the rotational nature might fit the kind of things that they were talking about during the process. Um, and we can kind of help people get into the business in other ways. Mm. Um, or potentially you're right, if maybe you're just not quite a fit for Ocado at that given time, um, then what we say is you have to wait till next cycle in order to kind of uh, to apply again and then go through the recruitment process. So. And we've had that before. We've had graduates that, you know, weren't successful in their first year, uh, but they went away, you know, worked in another business for, for a year or took a gap year, came back, went through the recruitment process, came to an assessment center again, um, and then ended up being offered and, and joining the program. So it definitely does happen. Um, but we say it's it's one in, during that one cycle because things tend to stay pretty much the same throughout that cycle. They only change every year. Um, you have to wait till next cycle in order to reapply. Okay, then. Brilliant. Okay, so I've got some more questions that I can um, I have from the session. It looks like there's a bit of glitch on the chat box right now. Um, but there's plenty to be to be cracking on with them. What I've also noticed is that um, one of you guys there has really helpfully posted the links to your um, early careers pages online. So we've got the link to your website on there as well, plus your profile, which is on the National Graduate Week website, which is a hub of information. But I've got some other questions for you. Um, what kind of practical practice um, can somebody do in in preparation so is there anywhere online or any tutorials or any videos that they can do because obviously this is so new to everybody um where can people kind of draw their inspiration from it's a good question i think first off attending sessions like this um i'm sure there's also i've i know i've delivered similar sessions on youtube and, and things like that that you can you can find i think hearing directly from employers about how they structure things. Everyone's got their own slightly different spin on it. Uh, and just attending this session won't be the, you know, um, the be all or end all and, and will help you in every single recruitment process. So definitely get as many different perspectives on it as you can. Um, in terms of actual physical websites or, or kind of uh, places to go, Aoife and Joe, I don't know if you guys had anywhere in particular that you looked at um, when you were going through the process. Um, I just had a look online. Um, I, I googled things about assessment centres and then when it came to my presentation I practised it with some of my friends, um, some of my housemates just to make sure that I had it down. 
Um, but I would say researching about the company is so important and will really help you out answering any questions that come up in the assessment centre as well. I did similar to Joe, but also spoke to my university because they also had like mock assessment centres and mock virtual assessment centres, which was really helpful as well. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you, guys. Um, just right. to very quickly interject, just to add on to that as well. Um, if you and your friends are all going through, you know, all applying for grad programmes, as soon as one person goes to a, an assessment centre, speak to them about their experience. And if you're the first one, then share that experience with your friends. Um, but equally, if, if anyone that you know has very recently been through a virtual assessment centre, sit down, ask them what it's like, what was their experience, how do they find it? Because um, that, that will be really valuable as well. Okay. Wonderful. Um, a couple more about the actual assessment centres and then um, I've got some questions about actually Ocado as, well, as like working for you in itself. Um, first one about the assessment centre though is what is the dress code? So um, is it interview dress obviously being online? Um, is, is it any different to um, what we, you would do in person or how would you advise on how people should present themselves? It's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I, every every company would would have their own policy on it. So I would definitely ask that point of contact about what would be appropriate. Um, at Cardo, we kind of generally have a culture of um, smart casual, I guess. Some are slightly more casual than others, as you may see today with my just sort of grey t-shirt on. Um, but I would say probably if you're if you're going to um, an assessment center what we kind of say is always just make sure you're comfortable you know don't don't wear a suit and tie if it's also a boiling hot day like the last thing that we would want is someone sitting there and, and being uncomfortable during a recruitment process uh, during an assessment center so yeah i would say wear whatever's comfortable but just air slightly on the smarter side um just as it is uh you know you're making first impressions with people and, and things like that but um but yeah, I mean, we always try and tell people don't wear a suit and tie, but you get some programs like finance, for example, you, you tell people not to, and then you log on in the morning and you've got 15 people wearing suits and ties. And it's like, okay, like, I guess there's no, nothing wrong with that. You absolutely can do that if you want to. But um, but yeah, we, we kind of just say smart casual, you know, if people wear just a, a smart jumper, that's absolutely fine. We're not, we're not judging too much. Brilliant. That's so helpful. Um got another hit what is an an absolute definite no no for an ass a, a virtual assessment center what do you we, we've had your top tips which is fabulous but what do you absolutely have to not do slash avoid it's a good question um thinking back to the assessment centers that we've hosted and where um where sometimes we've had something that we, however good the candidate may have been in other group activities, we've then just not quite been able to move past it, is when people are potentially too dominant during those group activities. And I think so often that just comes across, uh, it's, you can kind of boil it down to nerves, but sometimes when people um, taking the lead and showing leadership skills is great, but when you do that at the detriment of other candidates during the process uh, in your group, that that can be a bit of a red flag for us in terms of um you know going back to what we're looking for we're looking for those collaborators and those team you know those team fits um if someone has potentially been slightly confrontational if someone has you know talked over people and not allowed other people to get their ideas and share their ideas for us that's that's something that's quite hard to, to kind of move uh move through um and as i said i think sometimes that can just be a nerves things and people are so keen to demonstrate themselves and show uh you know show what they've got and show all of their ideas um but that would probably be my my number one in terms of yeah just just it's it's fine to take the lead it's it can definitely be a good thing you can show that you're in control and you understand the activity but you know you you should be helping everybody look good the the task should be collaborative and i think as well this is the culture might be slightly different than other businesses but we often have, you know, our business management program, for example, we've got 32 spaces for it this year. We can only get about 16 people at an assessment center. So when you're at an assessment center, you're not fighting for the spots between each other. 
you want everyone to look good and it, it and that that comes across in the way that we want the that we try and pitch the day is you're not fighting for spots this is this is a collaboration task and everyone should want to look good so people that stray away from that and potentially um are a little bit too dominant and, and potentially a little bit confrontational during those activities <laughs> probably my biggest uh, biggest watch out okay that i think leads me quite nicely on to a question that is aimed um for joanne Dufa, which was um if you had your time again um what would you repeat i.e what did you like about what you did but what would you not do so what lessons i guess have you learned from your own assessment centers i think i would worry less worry less about what's going on in the background i know some when we're at home now working there could be pets running in or your internet can be down just try not to stress about that um if your internet goes down or you're having technical difficulties we always have someone on hand to help with that so don't let those factors ruin your overall performance um and i would also say just try to enjoy it um i think it is really good i think henry said earlier like it's about as well you seeing if you're fit for that company so to always learn something and take something away from the day so if if it wasn't successful you can take that forward and apply it to the next assessment center so i'd always be open to learning um and making the most of that day yeah i'm the same with joe like definitely see it as kind of i took the had the mentality of it was like a practice because you can always take something from the assessment center and apply it to the next one i'd done some face-to-face -face ones Ocado was my first virtual one but there was definitely even stuff in the face-to-face -face ones that you could apply in the virtual assessment centers and also similar to what henry had said like don't worry it's not about how much you say it is about the value of what you actually are saying i think i was a bit too like much fixated on oh i didn't say as much in this group task as i had done in the previous one but at the end of the day it's what you're actually saying and not the amount you're saying and how much you're talking okay that's really helpful <coughs> Good, good point there about internet connection. This came through a couple of times, actually. Um, I've been there myself. <laughs> when you've, you're on a, a really important phone call or whatever, and your internet is, is crackling or breaking or you're kicked off altogether, obviously, worst time ever that you can do it is an assessment center, it will feel. Um, what happens? So you said that there was technical support, but yeah, what, what happens if, if that does happen to somebody? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of things that we we try and do to troubleshoot it. So we've got a, a separate hangout call as that technical support that people can drop onto, uh, and that way they don't have to you know distract from the group activity, and they can kind of go and and, and have some one to one attention. On Google Hangouts, what you can actually do is dial in using your phone. So if your internet is gone, there's a number that you can ring. You type in the code for that specific. Um, uh, that specific hangout and then essentially you can join the call using your phone and, and kind of interact that way now there's then you can't necessarily see the visual or if your internet is is kind of here and there you can maybe have the visual up on your laptop and you can then just have your audio come through the phone um, if you can't have any of the visual visual then what we do is we just prep the group to say look if there if you are sharing your screens or you're looking at anything um, although there's not a lot of that in, during our group activities um, in terms of um, sharing screens and things like that, um, please could you just describe what's going on and, and just be conscious of that of that person. If something absolutely catastrophic has happened, internet goes down, signal's gone, the candidate's just you know gone completely AWOL because of um, some disaster, then we'll normally have a follow-up call um, with them. And we, uh, if it's the interview, we can always reschedule the interview. Um, if it's a group activity, um, yeah, I guess I guess we'd probably look at maybe moving them to another assessment centre, even if it's not necessarily the assessment centre for their programme. Um, sometimes the group activities can be similar enough, and we can kind of we can kind of get them involved in in other ways. But that's not had to happen just yet, thank God. But um, but yeah, there's a couple of things that we can do. Um, and just just very quickly on um, on what we were saying before about 
please don't ever feel that if you have bad internet or something like that happens that it's going to reflect badly on you like we've all been working virtually now for a year and a half these things do happen we were, i was one of our assessment centers maybe like six months ago there was a candidate whose fire alarm started going off during one of the group activities and he straight away put himself on mute and it was like is everything okay like do you need to go and deal with the fire alarm he was like no 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 my parents are going to deal with it it's fine we're like it's okay if you need to run off if your house is on fire you can, you can go and deal with it and then um yeah after about he, he would he'd come back on to like say stuff but you could still hear it going off in the background and yeah after about 10 minutes he had to run off and, and deal with it basically I, I, I don't know exactly what was happening but yeah he then had to go for about 10 minutes came back once it had all sorted and that's fine that's that's what work that's what happens now you know that's that's not going to count against him his fire alarm was going off there's nothing he could do about that and then we just made sure he hung hung around kind of just after the call and we just made sure that everything was okay and that he could continue with the rest of the day so yeah those things happen i wouldn't i wouldn't panic too much um everyone's pretty understanding about you know working from home and how that how that can all how things can randomly pop up like that i think you read my mind there because the next question that i had written down to ask was can you be penalized for distractions so you've already answered that in in honesty which is brilliant um we are, um, we've got 15 minutes left, just short of that. I've got some more questions for you. Um, one minute. Do you send a copy of the recording after it's been completed for the, for the virtual event, i.e. for feedback and so on? Um, that's a really interesting idea. Um, we don't so we don't record we don't record the assessments um so we wouldn't have anything to to send afterwards um but what we what we do do is um obviously the assessors are making notes throughout each of the activities as they go and then when we at the straight after the assessment center all the assessors and us and the team all get together on one big call and we talk through every single candidate. So although the assessors have made notes, we then kind of have a conversation about each candidate and how they got on during each of the activities. And it will be, you know, a couple of a couple of our members in our team who are just sitting there furiously taking notes throughout that entire session as well. So we then call every candidate a week after the assessment center, uh, within a week. And if they haven't been successful, we basically, we can talk through all of the notes that were taken about them during the activity and all of the discussions that were had about them after the activity as well. So they can have that conversation with us and we will have also heard it. So we can kind of reason reason through it with them. Um, and what we've started doing as well is even candidates that are successful, we will still give them that entire feedback and include the things that are saying, oh, we thought you could have done this a little bit better or we wanted to have seen a little bit more there. Um, not to bring them down or anything, but I think all feedback is is helpful feedback, and obviously we we make sure that it's constructive. Um, so we don't have the recording, but I might go away and have a bit of a think about that. See if that's something that we could do. I guess it would be harder for the group activities because you might need everyone's permissions in order to kind of be able to share it. But for the interview and presentation, we could we could explore that. So good okay. idea. <laughs> that is brilliant. Um, right, some kind of softer questions now, more about Ocado as a whole. I've got some questions for Joe and Aoife, um, which were, uh, well, are, um, what, how do you feel that the culture is at Ocado and what do you enjoy uh, about working there? So I love the culture um, at Ocado. The office is a really nice office. All the facilities are really lovely. Um, I also love that um, Ocado operate in the hybrid way of working. So m in my team personally, we work two days in the office and three days at home, which I think is really nice to have that balance. And also I love that Ocado have recently announced their um, working anywhere policy. So for 30 days a year, you can apply to work in a different country. So for example, you have family in Spain, let's say, you can go and work for a month in Spain from virtually from wherever you, you'll be staying. Um, so it just means you can spend more time family and just very flexible, which is what I love about the Ocado group as a whole. To add to that as well, there is very much a like a graduate community, which I find found like relocating very helpful because then you don't feel as much like 
you're on your own. You, there's so many other people that are in like similar situations and it's a good like transition from university to actually working life. That actually brings me on to another question, which was around um, the culture within the, the graduating cohort. So for everybody that's coming on board together, how do you um, build um, so relationships with people, really? Um, how do you make work friendships and colleagues and communicate and, and see each other? So I found that throughout my whole recruitment process um, at Ocado Group, there was constant communication between me and the company. And then also we managed to form group chats um, with our cohort for that year. So first of all, there was a LinkedIn group one. And then through that, we created WhatsApp groups. Before we started, we went on a few meetups just to like, get to know each other, to talk to each other. We also had socials before we even started um, the grad scheme. So like throughout the year, we had virtual socials because it was still locked down. Um, where we would just get to know each other, have like a casual chat in the evening. And so that was really fun. And it, you, get to, you got to know about more people who were going to start and sort of start building friendships and relationships from there. OK. And just to add on to that as well. So when we we sort of when we transition out of our recruitment stage, so um, when we've kind of finished all of our assessment centers as a team we kind of transition into uh keeping everyone warm and, and kind of in touch because often you know we can offer a candidate in potentially november for them to start in september 20, the next year so sometimes people have like a 10 month run-in from being offered and, and and eventually starting so um so yeah what joe was saying i mean I, I know that there's a lot of those social activities which people kind of do off their own back but we will also have um quite a few key dates in the run up to people starting that is either, you know, entire cohort. So we get all we maybe 100 people together, what used to be in the office, but now is on a big kind of group call and share specific updates about what's happening with the programs and what processes are going to be like when people start, but then also kind of more program specific stuff. So we will have meetings with um, what we call scheme owners. So the, the, the person that kind of looks after the grad program in that area, who again, can share a lot more kind of specific details about that area and that way as well those are a little bit more intimate where people can then sort of have a bit more of a dialogue with one another across the different programs um and then right up until maybe about two or three months before everyone starts we do these kind of uh we call them like live sessions and so essentially we were thinking about making them podcasts but i think we preferred the idea of getting everyone on a call together but those will be on things specifically around you know relocating or living at home with your parents or whatever it, you know that that whole kind of dynamic and we get grads on that are currently in the business who are living in either in any of those situations so one person who's living from home one person who relocated and lives in london or one person who lives in hatfield and they all share their own experiences about how that was and and we do similar sessions about getting to know your manager when you start um things like how to you know work from home and come into the office and any tips and tricks around that kind of dynamic and so those are completely optional sessions if people don't want to attend them they don't have to um, but we have those kind of touch points as well that obviously we then get to know people a little bit more before they start but everyone else kind of gets to know each other so the idea is that when it is your first day it shouldn't really feel like your first day because you know the people that you're starting with you've met everyone in the team before you've met your manager before you've got a buddy in the year above who you've already had a couple of meetings with and it, that transition into starting, you know, potentially kind of your first your first job after uni um, should be smooth. And obviously, we're still here to help out during, you know, during those first couple of weeks or whilst you're, whilst you're on the program. Um, but yeah, that's, wow. that's a little bit about that running. OK, I've got about, I think, three more questions that I can fit in. We've got six or so minutes left. Um, I'm going to save, um, I think, Aoife and Joe maybe to the very end. Um, this is a question for um, for you about post COVID. So, um, are there any differences to working within the office now in the wake of COVID? So, are there any precautions that people need to be aware of, or how have things changed, or, or have they really not? Oh, is that for me or for Joe? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking Joe and Eva to the end for my final. Oh, sorry. Question. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So, um, so yeah, the the Ocado in particular have put out a lot of things to help people feel safe. So they've kind of changed some of the layout of some of the floors to be more around collaborative spaces where people can have, you know, standing meetings around whiteboards and things like that, rather than what it used to be, which is kind of mainly kind of desks and all that kind of stuff. There's free masks as you walk in. You can grab as many test kits as you want as well, and, and you can kind of take them home and they're, they're, they're kind of given out. And obviously the hand, hand sanitizer left, right and center. So um, in terms of, I will often about once a week, just grab about 30 masks on my way out. And then I just have them at home and again, Ocado are more than happy to kind of provide all of those stuff. I think the nature of work will change in the sense that um, being in the office is going to be much more around having your team meetings and focused on collaboration tasks. So team updates, one-to-ones with your manager, um, updates on different projects and all that kind of stuff. And they will be kind of condensed more down into those days that you're going to be in the office and you can do that in person with the idea then that the days that you're working from home it's not to say you won't have any meetings, but you'll have less meetings and that way you then have more time to be able to focus a little bit more on on kind of, you know, just getting your head down and, and doing the kind of stuff that you need to do, ready to then have the general updates and team meetings on the days that you're in. So there will be a little bit more of a different rhythm to to this kind of hybrid working, which um, which is nice because it, it's, it's fun being in the office and just you know, being able Absolutely. to chat to people and, and not feeling so pressured to be like, oh my God, I've got to do X, Y, and Z today because you know that those days are protected time to spend more time with your team. Brilliant. Um, quick question here, quick fire ones. Um, I graduated three years ago. Can I still apply? Absolutely. We yeah. want just to make sure that the program's right for you. So if you've, if you've got too much, the only reason why we would uh, reject someone uh, in that vague situation would be because we feel like they've got too much experience and they wouldn't be necessarily learning throughout the program. But that's not to say that it's a blanket. No, absolutely not. We we can have people that have graduated, you know, five, six years ago, in theory, um, as long as we feel like the program's right for them. Brilliant. OK, guys, about two minutes to go. So um, if you can summarise, Joe and Eva, um, why you chose Ocado over another organisation, can you tell us why? Yeah, so I just felt from the get go that the, the whole recruitment process was so personable. Um, the 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 recruitment person who was dealing with me i felt like she was more of a friend she'd always constantly email me call me make sure i'm okay make sure i'm fully prepped she sent me lots of links and videos um to help me with my preparation for the assessment center um so i just felt especially when i was applying last year um in the height of covid and a lot i felt with a lot of companies that I was kind of like a number, someone to get through. Whereas with the Cardo group, I felt I was less of a number and more me as a person. Brilliant. I'm the same with Joe. It definitely, all the communications before, it seemed like a company that cared about me as an individual. And that's definitely continued since we've started. Like everyone is friendly. Everyone wants to help you and support you. And it's just, it's good culture. Brilliant. Guys, that has been amazing. Um, I think we've covered pretty much everything, but what I would like to just do is for the 1,085 people who are with us now, <laughs> um, I'd like to say um, join on to um, the National Graduate Week website and visit the Ocado profile for links to their website and contact details in case there's been anything that you wanted to ask that hasn't been answered, jump onto there. Um, this session has been recorded, so it will be on demand on the National Graduate Week website, I'd say probably week after next, because we're going to have a lot of videos to get through. Um, but I would just personally like to say thank you so much um, to the team there. Um, it's been a wonderful session. It's been an absolute pleasure to host you. Um, I don't know whether you've got any kind of final words that you want to say with about 30 seconds to go. <laughs> Uh, just good luck, everyone who's applying for, for roles at the moment, um, whether it's at Akado or, or any other businesses. Good luck. Um, obviously, I'd love it if you applied for one of our grad programs. Um, as you said, check it out on, on uh, our careers page um, and feel free to add me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty sure I'm the only Henry Clendon on LinkedIn. So um, give me a search. And my inbox is a little bit crazy at the moment, but I'll try and answer any questions, um, you know, in, in, in inboxes um, on LinkedIn. So Wonderful. thank you very much, guys. Cheers. Thank you very much, guys. Take care. Thanks for your time.